Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day today. We thank you to be here on this beautiful beach. Lord, just the many, many blessings that you've uh, provided for us in our lives, uh, at both individually and as a church. We thank you for our brother Steve to be able to, enjo- to, to join us today and hear your word. Mm-hmm. And Lord, just for all of us in the audience today uh, to be able to, um, to hear and, and internalize, Father, the message that you have prepared today that you'll deliver through your servant, Izzy. Father God, we uh, love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. This morning we have a, a wonderful book to embark on. It is the book I actually started the church here with. Um, it's called the Book of Romans. And um, it is an awesome book of the Bible. To, uh, in Haley's Bible Handbook, um, it's a pastoral study aid we were taught about at Bible school. Um, Haley uh, uh, wrote, um, If you want to see your church transformed... Uh, teach the book of Romans verse by verse to your church. If you want to see your life transformed, read the book of Romans verse by verse and learn it. And you will see God move mightily in your life. And so this book is truly an empowering uh, message that will transform you in your, in your day-to-day Christian faith. It, has, it touches on so many different things to build our faith. And so this morning we're going to start off with the book of Romans and uh, just to give you a little background, as I like to do, I found, for me, I glean a lot more out of a book if I know who's writing it, who are they writing to, you know, the circumstances, maybe what's going on. And Because a little th- subtleties, if you don't know those things, you might just read right past those details, and they don't, they don't really have any significance if you don't know these little bit of background. Now, I don't know, how many of you took literature classes in, in school and you had to actually learn these disciplines, they, they taught us, you must first find out who wrote, when did they write, to whom were they writing, what was the main reason they were writing, you know, it's those kind of things. If you just know the reason why they're writing, it can change the whole appreciation you have for that piece of literature. I mean, it, it literally can make a book come to life. Whereas if you don't know, you might just read it and go, this isn't really touching me. I don't, you know, what's so significant? And then you find out some details. You're like, oh, wow. That's the last thing that guy wrote before he died. And he was writing to his wife from the battlefield. And, and he, you know, when, and you realize he couldn't give away certain things because they were, they, it would give away their position. And, like, so he's using clues and he's, and he's trying to tell her stuff that, you know, to, when you know those things, the whole, the whole letter you study can change. So I want you to know some things about this epistle. This is written by Paul the Apostle, and you can look with me at verse 1. It says here in the the beginning of Romans, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, he says, set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, whom, it says, was born a descendant of David, according to the flesh who was declared the Son of God by the power of what? Of the resurrection from the dead. According to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom, he says, we have uh, received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith among the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. To all the beloved, he says, of God in Rome, Call the saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's just the first paragraph of the book of Romans, but it tells you a couple of the details of what you're supposed to study in literature. Who's he writing to? The believers who live where? In Rome. And this is, he says, the ones amongst the Gentiles. Now, Paul, you know, was a Jew. In fact, he was a very zealous Jew in the Jewish Faith. He says he was actually, in one of his letters, he writes that he was advancing beyond all of his contemporaries in, in his zeal for Judaism. In fact, when Jesus was first being declared, that, you know, the message was going out that Christ is risen. He was, he was in the group called the Pharisees 
a Pharisee of Pharisees. This was the elite of the Jewish hierarchy, the, the, the snobbery, so to speak, of, of well, I don't know what's a call. I mean, they were like really, really legalistic, followed everything from the law, did all the stuff. You know, they wore the tassels, the, 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 the phylactery box on the, if you've seen a, a Jew that practices what, what, what is a practicing um, uh, uh, follower of the Levitical law, they'll have, they'll have a headband with a box right here. It has a scripture inside. They take literally the verse that says to put God's word at the forehead. And so they, you know, some people wonder what that box is on their head. And, and, they, and, they gr and, and not to cut your, your sideburns, so they'll have those little ringlets of, the, of their hair right here. They can have really short hair everywhere else, but, but they won't cut their sideburns. So they'll have these little rings, and they'll cover their head, and they'll do all these stuff that they, that they do. as follow They will have um, a, a ribbon-type thing that wraps tightly around their form all the way around, and they will bind verses to them, like I, I bound God, put God's word here and on my hands, and and and, and, and I put the the tassels on my on the hem of my garment, and all this stuff. They'll do everything that the law says. But Jesus, when he saw these guys, he said, "You whitewashed tombs. <laughs> you, 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 you guys are are whitewashed sepulchers. You're you're all clean on the outside, but inside, he said, they were full of what? Dead men's bones." You know, spiritually to Jesus, he said, you reek of death. You look good on the outside, but you're not alive. And one of them would sneak away at night in the Gospel of John chapter 3, and he'll, Nic a man named Nicodemus, and he'll say, what must I do to have everlasting life? And Jesus says to him, you must be born again. You know, and he's like, what, I go back in my mother's womb a second time? He's, no. Are you a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand? You, you, you've been born of the physical body, but what was inside? What was Jesus trying to get at? In his spirit, he was dead. You need that second birth, that birth of your spirit, that you could be alive to God. Jesus says, that's what you need, Nicodemus. Well, Saul was his name before he was called Paul. And we read about the author of the book of Romans in the book of Acts. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 9, I want to give you a little background of this man. And some of you are aware of this. You've You've studied with me, learned other epistles that he, you know, this man that we're going to, that is writing this, this letter to the church at Rome also wrote 12 of the other books of our New Testament. And some guys debate whether he was in on the book of Hebrews, making him 13 out of the 27 books. That's over half of the, uh, you know, almost half the, of the New Testament penned through this man that we're going to read about. But I want to show you where, w was this man always a follower of Christ? Was he always a good guy? No. no. No, in fact, in the book of Acts chapter 9, it says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest, and he asked for a letter, letters from them to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, that's what they called the early church, the way. You know, you ever wondered why on, so some of you have seen Bibles where it's printed. I, I grew up in the Catholic church, and they actually had an edition that right on the front of it said, The Way. And it was the, it was the Bible. You open it, it was the Bible, and it just said, The Way. Because the way, you know, Jesus said, I, in John 14, what did he say? Verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. So the church began to be known as the way. And if, if any of you should ever get asked this about Catholicism, just so you know, the actual word, the root of Catholic, is universal answer. And they translated it from Latin. Um, it it's a Latin word that was taken from the very word that we use for the way. So when they say, what does Catholic mean? Um, it really means the way. It's supposed to be the way. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes over time, traditions of men get mixed in and men muck up some things and, and, they, and they lose that sweet truth of where it, where it began. But I just want you to know the root of where it began. Okay, so here, Saul has asked from the, the leaders of the synagogue, can I have permission? I need you guys to write me a letter. So I can go all the way to Damascus and I can persecute anybody 
that says they belong to this way. They're really annoying. They're going around telling everybody that Christ is risen and, and you know, this Jesus guy rose from the dead and, and he's, he's uh, you know, alive and, and, and we need to be born again. And what are they talking about? I'm a Pharisee. You know, I'm the religion. He's wearing the box, doing the whole thing. And he's like, I, you know. So it says here, they granted him the letter, by the way, that he might be able to bind both men and women and bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so in verse 3 of Acts chapter 9, it reads, And as he was traveling, it happened that as he was approaching Damascus, that suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get, he said, But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And then the men that traveled with him stood speechless, it says, hearing a voice, but not seeing anyone. Only he gets to see the Lord, okay? He sees this light, a light brighter, it says, than the sun at high noon. And the original, that's what it reads. That's how bright the light was that is shown to him. The Lord revealed himself. Now, you guys have read the story. You know what happens. Saul gets up and it says in verse 8, when he rose from the ground, though his eyes were open, I want you to pay attention to this. His eyes are open. Yet, could he see? No. No. Blinded by the light. That's what he was, man. He was blind. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days with, without sight. Neither did he eat nor did he drink. Now it says there were disciples there at Damascus, a man named Ananias. And, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard about this man. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Lord, you know, I, I excuse me, objection. I know about this guy. And he, he has the, he, it's like the law is on his side. The, 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 the religious leaders are with him. And, and this, I could just see him going, this is a bad idea, Lord. <laughs> you, you, now, none of you would ever say this to the Lord, right? The Lord's telling you to do something like, sorry, Lord, that's a bad idea. But, <laughs> but pay attention to the details. The Lord told him, that Saul was praying and that God had revealed to him while he was praying that a man named who? Ananias was going to come and lay hands on him and he was going to regain his sight. Now, you, this is the point where you hope Ananias listens to the Lord because he, he could just say, forget it. I ain't going, man. <laughs> that guy's a bad dude. I don't feel like being imprisoned beaten and he said he had some people stoned and I'm not, I'm not doing it but listen to what Ananias said in verse 15 the Lord then said to him go for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and before kings and before the sons of Israel for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake Ananias don't worry He's caused suffering, but I'm going to show him what he'll suffer. Now, this is Ananias, well, verse 17. You guys probably know the rest of the story. He departs. He enters the house. He lays hands on him and says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, it says, there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. And for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying that he is the Son of God. This man had a radical conversion. 
Now, in this conversion, we find out that the Lord speaks to him. And I like this part because this is, I joke that Jesus is part Sicilian because of my roots. Because he says to him, he says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth who? Me. But Jesus had already risen. You guys know this part, right? In the book of Acts, he had already rose and ascended to the Father at the first, the second chapter in the book of Acts. He's, he's up in heaven. So, this is why I say he's Sicilian, because who was he really picking on? The followers of Jesus, his, his bride. His fa- you know, we're called the bride of Christ, right? Every one of us that believe in the Lord, collectively, we, we are his bride. That's how much he loves us. And he says, you're my bride. But if you pick on his bride, like try this to a Sicilian family. Pick on my bride. <laughs> I don't really wish you would because it wouldn't be good for you. And, and I don't say that because of meanness. I say that because we were taught, whose duty is it to look out for your bride? The groom, right? We're supposed to look after our bride. And Jesus says, you picked on my bride, you picked on me. You pick, a f- you pick on her, you're picking, that's it. You, that's, I know he's Jewish, okay? I'm not saying he's really Sicilian, but I'm just saying in spirit here. Comes out a little, you know? I can relate to this part. The Lord, t- now, can you imagine, you're, you're there and you're, you, you got, le- I got authority to go put these guys away. And Jesus shows up brighter than the sun at high noon and says, why are you picking on me? And blinds him. Now he has to be led by the hand to the city. And he's got to spend the next three days blind. And Jesus, now this part I know because of the prayer thing between Ananias. You've got to pay attention to the details. See, when Ananias is praying, Lord, I shouldn't go talk to this guy. He's a bad guy. The Lord says, don't worry. I already showed him how much he should what? Suffer for my name's sake. Got it covered. He's, he caused suffering. You know, the Bible says, whatever you sow, that's what you what? Reap. Even in his conversion, God is fair. He says, this guy has caused pain for the gospel. He's going to suffer pain for the gospel. Now, some people don't like me to preach this, but it's just, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. How many of you know Jesus said, in this world, in John 14, he says, in this world you shall have tribulation. He doesn't say, you shall have a bed of roses with no thorns and only petals, and it's going to be smelling so nice, and everything's going to be one, right? Does he say this life is going to be easy? He says, I'm the Lord. I'm the master. And if they treat me this way, and you're my servants, how are they going to treat you? Right? I mean, if they treat the master and kill him and crucify him. By the way, how, how tr- well were the apostles treated when they, you know, through their lives? Standing ovations everywhere, right? <laughs> Follower of Jesus. Yay! No. Persecuted, ridiculed. You can even read in secular writings that Peter, oh, Peter, who, wet socks, Peter, I call him, open mouth, insert foot. He's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Lord, I'll follow you to death, man. I'm with you. <laughs> You're going to deny me three times tonight before the cock crows twice. No, Lord, I'm with you. You guys have read the story, right? right? Do you know that in secular writings that Josephus records that when Peter would walk around Jerusalem, people used to go, cock a doodle doo they used to cock like the, just to remind him of what? His failures. Now this is written in a secular history book, not the Bible. But just so you know, this, this world is not easy on us. And they love to point out, they, nobody wrote in the secular history books and he got to walk on water. <laughs> you know, like Peter, if I was Peter, I'd be like, look man, so I had a bad night, but I did walk on water. You right? But in the end, all the apostles save John, who gets banished to the island of Patmos. They tried to kill him. They boiled him in oil. It didn't work, so they banished him. But all of the other ones suffered a pretty horrific death. If you want to read a book called Fox's Book of Martyrs and learn 
none of them went out with what we call Peter got crucified and they and, and when he went to the cross he said I'm not worthy to die the same way as my master could you turn me upside down I was actually crucified upside down oh Fox's book of martyrs Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's just a dry read, secular history recording the persecutions what have happened. And just the uh, only reason I tell you this is because some people today in, in Western Christianity, I think we have um, a society that has become really soft. And we don't like the idea that there'd be anything that would challenge us, anything that would be struggling or hard. And if it, and people, the Bible says in the last days, people will heap up to themselves teachers that, that tickle their what? Their ears. They tell them what they want to hear, but they leave out some of the, the, the legitimate truth of this life. I mean, sometimes we have hardships. Now, see, the hardships are covered in the Bible. The Bible says you could go through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember Psalm 23? Everyone quotes it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? And, and he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me by the still waters. He restores my soul. They love that part, but they, they leave out the next part. You know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for what? Thou art with me. You guys got this one. Good. See, he didn't say you're never going to walk through dark times. Hard, hardship. Valley of the shadow of death. That's a bad place, okay? <laughs> but if I, if I start you off with, Guys, sometimes there's going to be hardships. But remember this. The Lord is what? With you. If I teach you that even you're going to go through persecutions and sufferings. But remember, the Lord is what? With you. If I can drill into you that the Lord will be with you no matter what you face. You're going to stand a lot better chance of finishing the race strong in your faith. Then if I tell you it's going to be all wonderful, there's never going to be any problems, and then at the first sign of problems, what, what happens to your faith? I mean, many, many a believer was taught a watered-down gospel, and they, and they have suffered shipwreck in their faith now. Because the first time they encounter hardship, they go, I must be doing it wrong. Maybe I just don't have faith. Maybe I'm not even saved. Oh, I might as well quit. Believe me, that train of thinking has passed through the station too many times and i've had to listen to it too many times because somebody didn't teach them that you might have to suffer but jesus said blessed are you when men persecute you for my name's sake not blessed are you when men persecute you because you're stupid okay <laughs> don't be using your stupidness and saying i'm just being persecuted for jesus no some of you being persecuted because you're dumb <laughs> and you're doing dumb stuff stop the dumb stuff but if you're just serving the Lord and you get persecuted, take comfort. You're in good company. Because Saul was a persecutor of the faith and Jesus went, you. First of all, Saul in Hebrew means desirable. It's the male equivalent of, for the gals, it's the, 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 the in the English we say, you know, the hotties, the, the fox, the really pretty girl. In, in, in Hebrew, if you say Saul, it's the male version of handsome, you know, desirable. It's literally translate desirable for like a desirable, handsome guy like um, GQ. There you go. The d on the front of the magazine, the GQ guy. There you go. I'm Saul, you know. The Lord goes, we ain't going to call you that anymore. We'll call you Paul. <laughs> Paul in Hebrew means little one. You're a little too full of yourself, so we're going to change your name. Just one letter. But see, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't know the change is from full of yourself to little one. No more Saul. Let's call you Paul. Okay? So he changes his name. And he has a little discussion. For the See, Ananias tipped me off. The Lord spent some time telling him how much he's going to what? Suffer. Dude, welcome to the club. You're going to suffer. Now, who's giving the discipleship class right now? You know, who's the one teaching Saul he's going to suffer? I want you to pay really close attention to this detail. I know it sounds really stupid. I have to actually point it out, but who's the mentor? Jesus. Does Jesus not know how to disciple anyone? 
I mean, I'm pretty sure he does. Of all the people who, who would know how to disciple, get someone ready for the journey they're going to face, it's Jesus. And to think that he started off Saul's, now Paul's, <laughs> journey in the faith with number one lesson. We're going to go over something. You are going to suffer for the faith. Was Jesus being cruel or was he just bracing him? See, I believe personally the best thing you can do when it comes to helping someone get through something that lies ahead that's going to be... I grew up in a military family, if you didn't know that already. There is no trouble in my family. You know, it's a big... When we had to get together, we had ones from the Navy, Marines, Air Force. We had every branch, Army, all in our family. You put a bunch of guys from dis different... They're all under the same commander-in-chief, but you wouldn't know it when they get together to have a meal <laughs> because they're always... Oh, ours are better. Marines are tougher. No, and you know, I had to listen to this my whole life. Who's the best one? I'm the best. Oh, yeah. Okay. But you know, one of the things that they all shared in common was when it came time to go to training, they never sugarcoated to the fellows. You know, you want to be a Marine? You want to be a, a, an Army Ranger? They did not say, Army Ranger training is going to be so easy. It's going to breeze. You're all going to just do fine. No, they're, they like flat out yelled in your face. This is going to be hard. We're going to break you. Some of you aren't going to make it. We're going to find out what you're made of. This is, and, and they did not, what, why didn't they sugarcoat it? Wouldn't more guys make it? Would they? No, they would not. Telling them straight like it is, is the right thing to do. Now, if we do that to train up our military, and by the way, in Christianity, we're supposed to be Christians, which means soldier of Christ. Why don't we train up the soldiers of Christ and get them ready for battle? Hey, man, it's going to be tough. You serve the Lord. Sometimes it's gonna, people are not going to... You could be doing kind gestures in your community and somebody gets a crankiness about, Ooh, you're doing nice stuff. I don't like you. I'm going to sue you. You're feeding the homeless. Let me tell you, if you have a heart for helping people, get used to the fact there are some people who have the exact opposite. And those people will come at you. When you go to help the, the people that are hurting, they will come after you and they'll, they'll threaten you. They'll say, we're going we're gonna to serve you with a lawsuit. You're not allowed to feed those people down there in the park. You know, in the years I've been here, I just crack up. You know, we started a thing called Love, Inc., Love in the Name of Christ, made a little food pantry because certain guys were going around to the churches and kind of, they were, they were hustlers. They were, they were moving around, you know, Pastor, I need some help. Then they go to the other pastor, Pastor, I need some help. Pastor, they hit all the churches and made the circuit. And when we got together, we found out, yeah, that same guy saw me. And, oh, yeah, he saw me. That, what day was it? That was Tuesday. Yeah, same Tuesday afternoon. I had him Tuesday night, you know, and the guy's just making the, the rounds. And finally we said, let's get together. Let's pool our resources and send them to one place. And then that way they won't be like, because they were kind of scamming us. And we said, let's just help the ones that, you know, when they come there, we can help them, and then we'll know who's come, and then we can really be effective. And so that grew. It became the, ha the Hawaii Food uh, Pantry. Um, when we, and the FDA, one of the brothers got the FDA involved and, uh, to get some free food from the federal program. And now it's called the Hawaii Food Basket. And uh, so I've been here this July. I'll make 24 years for my wife and I. July 4th, guys, we're celebrating 24 <laughs> years. And, and the things that you start off as a little thing, you know, the Bible says if you're faithful with little things, God puts you in charge of what? Big things. And you can be used. You might not think it would make much of a difference to clean a little piece of the beach. But we started with cleaning the tree right there and trimming out all the bushes right there. And then we went to that tree. And there used to be a tree well, right under your foot is, a, is the stump. There was one there. And then we went that one and that one and that one and that one and those ones and all the way to down there and all the way to Sunday school over there. And it used to look like 
Look over there where all the bushes and weeds are. That's what this looked like. With thousands of rocks which now live out there. And some are in that wall that we built right there. And all this took place over 15 years. And you think, what can you do to help a community? This used to be the bad place to go when I came here. People said, they would warn you, don't go down there. You're a holly. You get beat up. That's like drug alley. It's a bad, it's just not a really nice place. Don't bring your family there. Today, this is where we bring our families, isn't it? See, you can affect change, but you got to know straight out. Don't go in thinking it's going to be all easy and there's going to be no effort. There's going to be no fight. There's not going to... Just think it's like going to boot camp. And you're going to get your, your behind kicked a little from the, from the, the, the sergeant. I mean, th there's stuff sometimes we got to get toughened up and, and understand. This, th what Paul's going to describe in the book of Romans is that this is called the good fight of faith. A good fight. This is, in fact, I want to get embraced for this book that we're going to study. But I need you to know the guy, it'll make a lot more sense when you understand who's writing. That he was the guy who was fighting against the faith when he started. He was persecuting the Christians, and God goes, why are you picking on me? Jesus, talk to him. I could just see it. Our Father in heaven. Have a little chat with that boy. Hey, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he pulled a quick one. Did you notice he said, who art thou, Lord? Who art thou? He said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now get up. <laughs> do you see that verse 6? It says it. I, don't worry. When we get to heaven, I'm going to ask for the replay on the big screen. I want to see him. You know, get up. Go to the city. And they had to lead him by the hand. He's blind. But while he was physically not able to see, God was going to open up his spiritual eyes to see some things this man needed to prepare him for what lied ahead. And he tells me through Ananias' discussion with the Lord, what was Jesus having a talk with him about? I mean, I call this like three days of intensive, you know, sermon preparation. Not, I mean, your, 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 your spiritual journey. We'll get you ready. You're going to suffer. Next day, you're going to suffer. It says that the Lord told Ananias, don't worry, I took care of this. I have shown him how much he's good. Now, did, did Saul, who became Paul, did Paul in the Bible suffer for the gospel? Do you guys know this? The book of Corinthians, he writes, I have been shipwrecked, spent a night and day in the deep. I have been beaten. He had received from the, from the Jews five times when, when they would... Uh, I'm sorry, the Romans, when they would whip a man with, 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 with rods they could, and, and, and scourges, they could whip a man 40 save one. In other words, at 40 was considered the 40th blow they could kill a man. So they save one back. We whip him within one stripe of killing him. Leave him alive to suffer the recuperation. Five times this man who's writing this book will receive that punishment. He'll be stoned to death, thrown over the city wall into the, into the rubbish heap as dead. And the Lord will say, get up, we're not done. <laughs> this guy, I mean, he is, he's amazing. I mean, but he was not taught from the beginning. It's all going to be wonderful and easy. He's taught what he was going to suffer. So if Teaching Christians that are starting out that you might face some persecutions, you might face some sufferings, is a bad idea to teach as a mentor. Then just understand, I'm only copying Jesus. Because sometimes somebody's leaving it out of the story. And I hate seeing the, the, the wake of that boat when it passes through. That you know, th there was there In our country... There was a very ear-tickling doctrine a couple decades ago about you are a child of the king. You are one of his precious children. Ye and, you know, he's your heavenly father. That's all true, by the way. But what they did is they spun it with a, an American Christian tickling doctrine that said, and you deserve to have everything that a king's kid should have. You need to have a Mercedes and you need to have 
all the blessings and a mansion and all this stuff because you're a child of the king. And it, didn't Jesus say, I prepare a mansion for you? No, he said, I go to my father's house and prepare a place for you. He did not say, I prepare a mansion for you down here. See, somebody didn't pay attention to Jesus' words. They twisted just to leave a little bit out, and that's dangerous. The devil does that, by the way. He quotes Bible verses, but he leaves off little details, you know. Has not God said that his angels will bear you up, bless you, dash your feet on a stone? Go ahead, Jesus, jump off this high pinnacle and smash yourself. Let the angels catch you. Funny that a fallen angel is quoting the description, the job description of an angel. Hey, aren't us angels supposed to catch you? Why don't you jump? Uh, if I was you, would be like, are you going to catch me? Because you don't seem to be doing the job you were created to do. See, the devil leaves out little things, and those little omissions can cause us great spiritual damage. So I want to teach it to you in its entirety, as best I can to get you filled in so you get to be equipped for the good fight that we face. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Now we know who's writing. And let's see how he introduces himself in this book. This is a very powerful introduction. He reads here in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. I don't even need to go any further. Does anyone know what a bond slave is? A bondservant, yeah, a bondservant is somebody who maybe in Jewish culture, if you got yourself into debt, you could go to the person that you're in debt to and you could offer yourself as a servant to work off your, your debt. You, you like literally say, I'll be your servant until the debt's paid off. There was a statute of limitation, so to speak, in the law. Every seventh year you had to um, release the people from their debts. So the longest term you could serve was seven years. But um, you find in the Jewish culture that some of the folks that wound up in debt, they would they'd go and they would um, say, you know, can I work it off? They'd work it off. And, and while they're working for the boss, maybe they met one of the other folks and fell in love with one of the gals. The guy got married. He had children. He's still serving his master there as one of the, as one of the servants in the house. And um, the seven-year period comes to time for releasing. And he says, you know, you're released from your, your debt. Your obligation's paid. And, and, the, and the fellow says, you know, I'm really not doing too bad serving you. I mean, since I've been with you, I've got a wife, i got my act together, I'm not gambling anymore, I'm not drinking, whatever it was that got him in this trouble. And I, and, and, and I like it with you, and I want to stay on and be your servant. But to be a, this is called to be a bond servant. This is a, servant, a servant's classification designed by choice, not by you did something bad and got yourself in trouble. So what the master of the house would have to do is take that person to the um, to the, f the doorpost, the lintel of the house, and he would ta take an awl and he would pierce his ear and put a gold ring in it. Big gold hoop says, signifying this person is my servant, but that says he's here because what? He wants to be. He, wants to be. he doesn't have to be. He just wants, he has found that I'm a good master. Now, if you had a bunch of bond servants running around your Y y your property. Someone came up and they didn't know anything else about you, but they saw that all the guys that worked there had a bond servant's gold hoop in their ear. What would it tell the people about the, the Lord of that house, the master? He's a good master. The guys that are serving him are here because they want to be. They found he is a good master and they want to serve. Well, what, see, if you don't know the background, this is why I say good to know the background. Look at the very first line of the book of Romans. Paul, a bond servant, a bond slave of who? Of Christ Jesus, the guy who blinded him. They said, you're persecuting me. We're going to have a chat. By the time he, oh, by the, if you're like me, I like to know kind of approximately when was the book written. So this is about 58 AD, the book of Romans is penned. 
So I know some of you are chronological learners. You like to know, you know, Christ died at 33. He went into public ministry at 30, three years public ministry. They, they crucified him, buried him. Three days later, he rose. That's in 33 AD. So we're now to 58 AD, 25 years later. After 25 years, we have this guy who, by the way, was around in the early days of the gospel, right? He was, per he was persecuting from the very beginning. So he's had about a 25-year or 24-year, like about as long as I've been here in Kona. This is how long this man has been serving the Lord. And his introduction of himself to this church at Rome is, I am a bondservant. I am a bond. You know what I have found out? What, what he's declaring is, who's my, I love my master. This is a great master to serve. Now, if you do 24 years following the Lord, and you still say he is a great master, that says more than I can even express. I mean, that's, you're going two and a half decades of service where you're saying I know who to follow I know who to serve because he is a great man that's his introduction to these guys now see I only have to tell you this because they already knew what year it was they were living in it it was 50 AD 8 AD for them they already knew Christ was crucified 24 years before and they know this guy was one of the early persecutors. And yet he has been converted and has been following the Lord all of these years. So when he speaks now about Jesus, he's speaking from personal experience. He's speaking from, let me tell you about what I have learned about him. The very one I persecuted. Now he doesn't say, you notice the introduction, he does not say Saul, a bondservant. What does he say? Paul. The little one is here to talk to you. I'm a bond slave of Christ Jesus. Called, he says, as an apostle. Now this is the part that I really think is worthy of an entire sermon, this very next line. Because I don't think in our culture too many Christians today know what God has called them to be. They don't know their spiritual calling from the Lord. Paul did, right? In, in fact, I just for a little extra credit, go through all of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament. You got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. You know, he was collaborated on First and Second Thessalonians. He wrote to Timothy a couple letters. You'll see that in every one of them where it's him as this introduction of, uh, of authorship, where he just says, Paul, I, Paul. Let me show you. Just turn to Galatians. I, I won't do every one, I, I promise. I just, just to give you one as an example. You can, for extra credit, read them this evening. Just read the first two verses of every one of Paul's letters. See if you notice anything similar. Like how they start like this. Paul, Galatians 1, verse 1. An apostle, not, not sent of men, no, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Hmm, okay. Well, I'll cheat and do one more. Ephesians. Paul. <laughs> An apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of who? Of God. Now, wait a minute. He said that before. And he, you know that Paul has to keep, and when he introduces himself, I find this. A guy's been serving for 24 years, and he has to still start off his letters with, I am called as an apostle not by the will of man. Because some guys were saying, how come you're an apostle? Who made you an apostle? What makes you the guy that says you get to talk to us about God? And you know what his credentials were? Um, my boss blinded me and told me what I was going to suffer. He said I had to change my name too. 
And I found out he's a really good boss. And he's the best guy you can serve. And I'm now his bondservant. And I am called an apostle. An apostle, the word literally means one who is sent out. A sent one is the, uh, the breakdown, actually. Sent one. Okay, who sent him? Yeah. And uh, so you're a sent one by whose will? Like what organization? Was there a church group that sent you out? Did you get sent out by, you know, an or some, some guys, some elders? He said, no. I was sent out by whose will? God's will. By the way, is that a good thing to know when, you're s when, 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 when you go to follow? Whatever God calls you to do, it's really good that you know it's him who called you to it. I, in fact, this is why I say a whole sermon could be dedicated to this, because most Christians in America do not know what their calling is from the Lord. Turn to 2 Peter. Let me show you this. Peter knows he's about to die. And he, when he writes 2 Peter, he actually says that the Lord has made his departure known to him. That I it's coming. It's imminent. So he says, uh, uh, the Lord told me I'm going to go. In verse 12 of 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of the things, even though he says you already know them, that uh, and, and, and even though you've been established in the truth, which is present with you. He said, but I consider it right, as long as I am still in this earthly dwelling, that I stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. But I... I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call to mind the things what I have spoke to you. Peter was one of those dudes who says, I don't care if I have to remind you and remind you and remind you. Because when I'm gone, I know God will make you remember what I said to you. And some of you know this because you had parents that, you think they harped on you because they were mad at you or something. They're just trying to drill it into you because they knew they wouldn't always be here. And when they're gone, isn't it amazing how some of the people who have really sown into our lives after they depart, some circumstance comes up and, and, and in your head, you can hear your grandmother saying a certain saying that applies to that situation. And she's not there. She's gone. But she said it over and over and reminded you and reminded you of that truth and buried it into your being. Peter says, I'm going to bury something in you guys' being. So even after I'm gone, you're still going to hear in, you'll, you'll be able to hear my voice in your head. The things that the Lord wants me to impart to you. Now, what did Peter say the Lord wanted him to impart? Well, Second Peter, we've gone over this one many a time, but in verse 5, he says, you guys have to have an active faith, a living faith, a growing faith. You have to add to your faith goodness, to your goodness, you add knowledge, to your knowledge, self-control, to self-control the purse with what? The beer ants. And then the perseverance, you add godliness, then godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, you add love. And if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, you will neither be blind nor useless. The true knowledge. Of the, if you don't keep growing in your faith, guys, you're blind. And Peter said it. He says, even after I depart, man, I want you to remember this. Verse 9. He who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. First Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling, and choosing or election for you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Anyone here want to not stumble? Me? Yeah, I'm in. He says, as long as you practice what things? The calling that God has for you. If you're called, I, I'm called to be a pastor teacher. There's no, I don't, after this long I got the, me the memo, okay? I know. But you know, 
the best safeguard I can do for my spiritual journey through this life is do what God called me to do. I don't get in trouble when I'm busy doing what he called me to do. If it's, if it's when I'm not doing his calling, his choosing for me, that's when I get in trouble. That's when I, you know. It, now, he knows that about me, so he just doesn't even give me a chance. I joke that, you know, in all these years, I never get a Sunday off. And the Lord, you know, some people are like, that's terrible, Pastor. I said, not really. He's just, he's just keeping me from stumbling. Because he knows our frame. You know, he knows every one of us. Some of us, we're just OCD or, you know, we, 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 we'll get ourselves into some weird thing, you know, just because we're, we're so easily distracted. And so the Lord gives us these words. Now, Peter says, I'm about to depart this world. I've shared this before, but always pay attention. When an older saint, if you get the privilege to be around an older saint when they're about to leave this world, get close to them and listen up. They never talk about the weather. They never talk chit-chat about small talk. They always talk these beautiful pearls of life. They, they might call you over. Listen, pay attention. I, I got to tell you something. And when they do, you better do this. Just forget everything else, all ears. Listen up. Because they impart some of the greatest pearls. Peter knows, I'm leaving. The Lord told me, I'm going soon. He wrote this right before they crucified him upside down, guys. He says, when I'm gone, I want to make sure that you practice. You be diligent to do God's calling for you. His election, his choosing. What did he call you to do? Believe me, not all of us are called to be up front. In fact, the Bible warns not to be, he said, let not many of you become teachers. I hate this verse, by the way. I got to teach it anyway, but <laughs> what's the warning against teachers? Let not many of you become teachers, lest you incur a stricter what? Judgment. I need stricter judgment, like a hole in the head. <laughs> but God laid it out, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. He expects you to, to step up. If he says you do, and you tell them to do, oh, this is a good one. You're going to tell them how to live, but you ain't going to live it? Does that fly with God? No. no. You cannot sit there and say, I'm here to tell you how to live for God, but I don't do it myself. It does not float with him. He will take you to task. Just ask any pastor. It's like, the, the more I try to do the calling he's calling me to do, the more I find out i got to stop doing a lot of stuff. That's not good. I have to practice the very things. I have to be an example of the faith. If I want to say to someone, hey, just live and follow the Lord and, and t you know, entrust to Him all your cares and, 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 and walk in faith and fight the good fight of faith. And I'm going to tell you to do that, but I don't do that? Does that float with the Lord? No. You are not given that as a leeway. In fact, you are exhorted by the word of God that you understand you're going to get a stricter judgment. You want to stand up in front of people and tell them how to live their life for God? Then understand he's going to take you to task. No, it's not because he's mean. He just wants guys to take this thing soberly, spiritually. This is a, this is a real thing. And Paul, when he's going to write to the Church of Rome, say, he's going to say, be sober in your spirit. You know, sometimes our spirits are diluted, polluted by this world. And we need to have that stuff, you know, taken away. And Paul's going to address that, okay? This is just the intro. But trust me, he's going he's to lead right to that very thought that we not be conformed to this world, but we be what? Transform by renewing our minds. You know, this is one of the best things for you. It's going to renew your thinking. 
As we go through the book of Romans, it will lift you up. It will make you just go, wow, this is the right. You will know. Listen, when we get done with this book, you'll be going, this is what I, some people come to me. That is what I was looking for in my Christian walk. I've been reading the Bible. Reading the Bible I never saw that. I'm like, it's right there in the book of Romans. How to be transformed by renewing your mind. We'll go over that later. But I'm just kind of giving you a little preview of what's coming up. Now next week, if you do me a favor, please read the first chapter of the book of Romans. It's going to take me a while. I had some really great Bible teachers that taught me this book in depth. Verse by verse, we studied the Greek. We learned all sorts of stuff in the background. And and. I've already completed teaching the entire Bible, every chapter, every verse to this body of believers here. If you sat with me long enough, you know, it took 15 years to make the first pass. I'm not sure I'll ever make a second one, but I'm working on it. I'm on my second pass, and uh, I've slowed way down. This is my wife says, this is inching through the word now with Pastor Izzy. She says we've got to change the name of the radio show to, um, and not as quick, okay? But I'm giving you more details. Now, I want you to pay attention because Paul, next week we're going to see why did he write this book. What was his motivation? Now you know who's writing, and you know he's writing to these believers in Rome. By the way, I didn't mention this, but anyone familiar with the times of Christ um, and Jerusalem? How, how was the relationship between the Romans and the, and, and, and the saints in Jerusalem um, at, at around 58 A.D.? Anyone know? Not good. At 70 AD, Rome will say, that's enough. And sa- they'll just sack it. They'll raise, raise, I mean R-A-Z-E. They will erase. We get the word erase. They will just flatten the buildings in, in the old city. They will just say, we are sick of you zealous, you annoying guys. And they're just going to come in and co- just literally slaughter. And the believers are going to be chased to, it says to the four corners, that's the Jewish way of saying north, south, east, you know, four points of the compass. They're going to be chased all over to get away. And when you read the book of Acts, well, I'll give you some more of that details, but like Priscilla and Aquila, um, they're going to be fleeing, you know, just the persecution. And, the, and, the, and, and they, w- they were believers in Rome. And you're going to see that the persecution distorts. One of the biggest persecutions is going to be spearheaded from Rome against these guys and that's just 12 years away from right here but to get you in the kind of like climate of what's going on it's building the the tension between the romans and the jews is really getting ready to come to a head and so this book will have some significant clues as we're we're studying and you when you know that in the background and he's going to say i'm writing to you gentiles not to the jews now paul was a jew Pharisee of Pharisees, but he says later, I was sent to be the apostle, the sent one, to bring the good news to all the ones that are not Jewish. Salvation was first, to, don't forget this, he'll tell us, not first to the Gentile, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And we'll see what role we can play in helping even our Jewish friends, encouraging them in their faith. Because they got it first. Huh? When I made you, I'm like, Good thing you're around, man. Because, you know, I couldn't be a Christian without you guys. I mean, you were the ones that, you know. I mean, Jesus was a Jew. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just adopted in, you know. Jew by adoption. That's what the, that's what the Gentile church is really looked at as we're just grafted in wild branches, it says. <laughs> I don't even think they were adopted in their eyes. But we are in God's eyes, so. So just know that. You are adopted into God's family, and Paul is going to give us some sweet things for our faith. So read Romans 1 for me, would you, just and and reflect on what I said, and see if you can spot the reason why he's writing. What's his motivation? Why does he want, you know, what's the big deal? that, that, That There's something to it. Once you know the why, the whole book will unlock. And you will get so much more out of it. So we'll get to that next week. Let's pray right now and uh, let this part sink in for us. Father, we just thank you that you would take a man that would persecute you the faith and turn him into a proclaimer of the faith. Lord, you took me from being a, well, never mind. You, you, you fixed me. 
And so I'm, thank you, I'm thankful, Lord, and I know we're all but works in progress. So, Lord, continue your work in each of us as we go through this upcoming week. Help us, Lord, with whatever we face. Just bury into us that truth of that Psalm 23, that no matter if we're in the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil because you're with us. Lord, be with us as we go from here now. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. I reserve the right to come back to a little bit more to teaching you about God's callings and gifts. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.